Good evening, and it's another joy to sit down and share the Word of God with you and know that His power is for us. And I forgot again to put this microphone on, so forgive me while I do it. Okay, we're on. Um, I want to share with you tonight something that is both very real in my heart and yet as we develop this, uh, I, the, the end to which we're going in this is a cry of my heart and I believe it's also a cry of your heart and I'm not sure that we'll finish it this week. I, I can see this developing into two weeks. But um, let's begin. It's in Psalm number 68. And I'm not going to read the surrounding verses because I'd have to explain them as I read them. And it's, it's not directly what we're talking about. So let's begin with verse 5. Psalm 68 and verse 5. Speaking of the Lord, it says, He is a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows. The word judge there, uh, understand it, it's real meaning, um, certainly in, in the language of the Bible, it means to one who sets things right. And so he's a father of the fatherless and he sets things right for widows. And a widow in the scripture, especially among the Hebrews, uh, of the Old Testament, there were two of the weakest kind of persons in society. It's just the way things were. Jesus changed it. Uh, the gospel essentially changed it, but in, in the days of the Old Testament coming into the New, the widow was the most helpless in society. She had no one. and. Um, to be a widow was to be at the very bottom of the society ladder and the other was an orphan and so when he says he's the judge for the widows it means he stands the support of the most helpless and those without any other protectors and he stands with them to make things right okay so he's the father of the fatherless he's the judge for the widows this, he, this is God in His holy habitation. So in His holy habitation, yet His heart is with the most weak and the most helpless of persons. And then it says, God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. God makes a home for the lonely. Or some of your older translations, actually I like them better than this, that they, they put it, he will set the lonely or the solitary, he will set them in families. And, and that, I, I wanted to read this because it brings out the word home and lonely is maybe a, a more well-known word than solitary but uh, remember those older translations he sets the solitary in families and this translation says he makes a home for the lonely and that that's the the verse that ha has gripped me in the last hours I'll be honest it was not the text that I was going to speak on tonight but um, I, I, I was urged in, in a very deep sense by the Spirit and I believe that all of us are going to relate to this. So he, he sets the solitary in families or he makes a home for the lonely. So this word solitary and, and that really takes center place here, the word solitary and all lonely which is what it means but in the languages of the Bible it, it means isolated a person solitary 
lonely, isolated. And then push that out a bit. It's also associated with someone without a parent. That is an orphan. It is someone without any support. That is someone like the widow of the Old Testament. Or you could say a misfit. They just don't fit anywhere and they're not connected. So it also means there's no place to call home. You're, you're solitary. You don't fit and, and you do not be part of a society that supports you. And it goes on to mean you're neglected. N no one gives this person worth or value. They're just sort of there. They're, they're almost ghostly. They, they pass through life as a ship in the night. Um, you know they were there, but you can hardly remember them. You, you don't give them any worth or, or value. And the word is associated with someone who is destined to wander and uh, my Bible translated parched places or a uh, wilderness, a bleak, obscure darkness, just destined to wander, going nowhere because they don't know where they're going. That's this person is describing. So they've been stripped away of all comfort and direction and support. But it also means, and if you know anything about herd animals, once an animal who normally is in a herd, once it gets away from the herd, it becomes a prey to predators. And that's what this word means. You're solitary, you're lonely, and once you're separated from the family, that which will support you, then you become a prey to predators. I, I, I remember in Africa, I, I was present um, during some lion hunts. I don't mean we were hunting the lions. The lions were hunting and I was watching. And, and um, it, it, it was an amazing thing to, to watch the lionesses, who are the killers, um, they, they, they'd let the whole herd, if it was bunched together, it would all run by and they wouldn't bother. They were looking for those who were disconnected to the herd, those that were the weak ones that couldn't run as fast as the others, those that just were getting to become on their own. They, they didn't keep up and that's the ones that the predators went for. And this, this word has that idea, you're lonely, you're isolated, you don't have the support of the herd or the family, and, and therefore you become a prey to predators. And so it also means an abused person who has indeed been exposed to the predatory hands and person um, who abused them. So here you are, a person without a friend in the world, living in a survival mode. This, this is the word, solitary. It's a, it's a horrible word. It's, it's a word that's got coldness in it. Solitary, isolated. And here, and did you notice it says, God in his holy habitation. That is what one would call the high heaven, God uh, infinitely above and beyond us, God in his holy habitation, he is the one who is for these persons. Hear this, this is what these verses have said. Are you fatherless, an orphan? He said, are you a widow, uh, the lonely? He said, in his holy habitation, the most high God, and yet he is for, and he is with, and he has a purpose for solitary persons, which of course goes beyond uh, orphans and widows of the Old Testament, um, far beyond, as we shall see. And it says he joins himself to such, the weak, the, those that are the 
and persons counted without worth or value, he joins to them and announces his purpose to set them in families, to cause them no longer to be isolated to but be put in a home with a society around them that will be those who uphold them set them in families and this is why I like the older translation because in the Hebrew language this set in a family is of tremendous importance the word means to sit down in a family or sit down in a home and it's so it's more than he makes a home though I guess that you could think that but the idea of a sitting you have come you've come home and you are now sitting and what does that mean throughout the scripture that word to be seated has in it the idea of having come to rest it's usually associated with either a long journey or some form of exhaustion or weariness. You're bone tired and you come to rest. You know that flopping into the chair and letting the chair embrace you and you've come to rest. The idea is of security. You have come to sit. It's safe to sit. You are no longer looking over your shoulder. You're no longer fleeing from predators. It's safe. You have come to sit and rest in a secure home. And the idea, biblically, of sitting is to remain. That is, you've come home. You haven't come on a visit to a friend's home. You have come into the midst of a home, and this is now your home. And you're going to be staying there in safety. Now, that's a, a, a neat understanding. But the word has two meanings to it. And the second meaning is, it's not just sitting. So, yes, it's sitting in rest, it's sitting in security, but the word has the meaning also of sitting in a place of honor. It means that you're sitting, and the very way in which you're sitting, or where you're sitting, means that you have now authority. You're a somebody. You, you have worth bestowed upon you. You, you have been given value. You're not just home. You're, you're not just sitting there, but you're a somebody. You are a somebody of worth and of value, and you are sitting there. Almost the word is used to describe an elder. That is someone who, they, they've got weight in, in society. And it's spoken of as a king sitting. And so, you know, when the judge in a court sits, well, that, that's a chair. And if you sit in that chair, you, you have the honor of the whole court. And also, you have absolute authority in that court. And, and that's the idea here. You're somebody... You, you have come from being an isolated prey to predators who probably has on you the wounds of abuse. You, you've wandered here and wandered there, and now this God who sits in his high heaven has set you. He's put you down in a family and in that family you'd better get used to it because you have worth and you have honor and you have respect as well as having at the same time the support of this family to get the picture now it's speaking he said some in families and my translation here the new american standard says in a home now, I want you to think about this, especially in today's world. This is speaking of the core, family, home. 
and, and understand me, a home and a family is far more than a house. I, I remember in many decades ago when we were traveling and someone asked my daughter Donna who was just a little tot and of course traveling we, we were traveling in a car and motels and that was it uh, from church to church to church wherever anyone would give me a pulpit and, and so they said um, where do you live where's your home and the little toddler Donna, she said, we, we have a home, but we don't have a house to put it in. And, and I've never forgotten that because you can have a house, but not have a home. You can have a home, but not a house. You, you get it, you see. A family. This word is strong word. It, it's, it's home. And all that goes with that idea of home. And when I say that, I have to go back to the Holy Trinity. You see, when we say as Christians that we believe in the Trinity, that the one God is three persons in eternal and limitless relationship of love, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that's not just... Uh, a doctrine that we stick up there on the shelves that that's something Christians believe. That orders our entire life. And Ephesians 3 says that father and family all originate in God the Father and the Son the Spirit. And, and so that's why Christians believe in families. That's why Christians believe in covenant foundation to families. Not because we just got a law out there that, you know, we have to get married and have a family and that's the way Christians do it. Good grief! No, it's because of what we believe. If you believe that our God is the original family, that our God is the original society and he made mankind in his image. That is, he made us social. He made us to be all that is included in that word family, which is the Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father, bathed in love, and the Holy Spirit, the object of the Father's love, the Son's love, as the Spirit loves the Father and the Son, and all in this celebration, which we've often called, as did the early church, the dance of God, as God himself is eternal and limitless celebration of love, which is joy, which is peace. That's the original family. And when he made us, and it says he made male and female, he made them in his image. And so we are created to love and be loved. We are created to celebrate in a holy dance of joy and peace, which is uniquely found in relationship. Relationship to the God who is the source of this love, and then relationship one to another. We were made for that. We were made to be known. Known by God. That is a God who is love and therefore it is utterly safe to let him see everything about me and to then develop a relationship with other humans that I'm not afraid that they can know me and I can be known and know and so love is transparent, love is honest Love has no secrets. Love doesn't hide in the darkness. It's, it's knowing and knowing and being assured of acceptance. One of the most beautiful words in the Bible is the word assurance. 
to know that you know you are safe. You are safe in the sight of this God. And not only safe in his sight, but you are safe in the hands of brothers and sisters in his family. It, home, family, that originates in the God who is love. It means being part of the circle of care. Uh, that is, family means you're, you're cared for, you are protected, you're provided, and you're also part of the caring and part of the protecting and part of the providing. Family is the ultimate safe place if we're using the scripture as our basis. Now, I know that for some people, uh, you would not think of those things when you think of your family. I mean, let's be honest. Um, I, I remember there was one lady, she actually worked for us many, many years ago, and, and she came from a terribly abused uh, father. A and she could say Holy Spirit, she could say Jesus, but she continually saw God the Father through her abusive father. And I kept telling her, you can only see the Father through Jesus. He said, no one comes to the Father but by me. So we don't look at God the Father through our fathers. Rather, through Jesus, we discover the Father. And then we know uh, Father for the first time. But to to carry on with that lady and use the word family that, that God willed to put us in family, she couldn't get that word out either because family to her was a chaotic nightmare. It was a place that was drenched in abuse and hurt and pain. And so that could well be, as you listen to me, these words are foreign. To think of a family as acceptance, safe place, where you can be honest and still be assured of acceptance, to be part of a circle of care and protection, provision. No, for some people that's hard. Well, let me introduce you piece by piece to the gospel that this is a family that I'm speaking of that maybe indeed you've never seen, never dreamed was possible. And it all originates in the Father who has made himself known to us in, in the Son. Because this is the will of the Father. He created us. This is bottom line. This is Gospel 101. He created us that he indeed might be Father, even as the Son, God the Son knows Him as Father. He created us that we, through the Son, might know Him as Father, and not know Him in isolation, but know Him along with a multitude of brothers and sisters, all who find their life and their participation in this relationship to the Father through the Son and all in the strength and immediate love of the Holy Spirit. I say, for this we were created. I mean, basic. This is the meaning of our creation. Anything less than this, hear me, leaves us restless and searching. Please hear me. That this is very, very basic and yet hardly ever talked about. For this that I've just been speaking of, the Father and His family that is in and through the Son and actualized by the Holy Spirit, for this we were created. Anything less than that leaves us restless and searching. And we might have a, a great understanding and experience of much of the riches of the glory of God, but this is the reason of our creation. 
or as Ecclesiastes said, he has placed eternity in our hearts that we can never really be satisfied with a, a goal or a destiny that ends with the created. It, it, we, we, we were made for and our hearts are in an upheaval longing for the heavenly he puts eternity in our hearts we can never be satisfied with the created as the goal of our meaning and so uh, if we don't know this then we we start looking for family you know most of the problems in this world today are all about this distorted twisted search for family <laughs> you see we were created to be the father's children in his son and then to know our human brothers and sisters as we could never know them before as true God family and if we don't know that or even the possibility of it, we go looking for identity. We go looking for family. I mean, have you noticed, especially in the last uh, however many years, but there's been a, an emphasis upon your racial, your national identity. Um, so, someone said to me, so, so you're an English American. Good grief. I, I don't find my identity in, in where I came from, and I've got to go and plaster it everywhere that I'm an English-American. You see what I mean? I, uh, no, but why do we do that? Why is this happening all around us, this craving that everybody knows my ancient roots, and I've got to find those who are the same as me, and we build circles around us, and because you don't know the father and his family because once you know the father and his family yes you're, you'll still be English you'll still be Latino you'll still be Norwegian you'll still be Filipino but it will have transcended that and, and you recognize that you are part of his family and that you have a real identity with that family why, why do people gravitate to private clubs? Apart from some benefits they might get, but there's that sense of belonging. That there's a sense of someone who will stand up for me or something like that. So many churches, now I hate to say this, I really do, but so many churches, and I'm not I, uh, speaking of just one, it crosses all different churches, but really the, it's a sense that they're trying to find a family in the church but it's a family that is finding its center in that particular church and anyone coming in from the outside immediately feels that you've come into almost an alien family uh, and you feel like a stranger there because They've missed it. They don't see the Father. It's the Father and it's His family of sons and daughters, all who find their identity in Jesus the Son. And they have this incredible life within them that joins them to other brothers and sisters through the Holy Spirit. And when you walk into that, you forget what the place is called and you forget that these people you've never met them before you find inclusion and you find love and welcome and you've met the holy family of the holy trinity what why, why is it that people gravitate to sports i remember and i'm gonna sorry name it because it's a very real in my mind i was in denver and um, their, their team, whatever, some sports, but their team had lost. And I tell you, a depression.
procession came on the town and even got in the church. And what on earth had happened? This darkness, their team had lost. What, what are they searching for? It, they're searching for identity and family and they totally missed it, you see. It's, it's not in a sports team, it's in the father and his family. And, and I, I say, finally, giving you, I think you're getting what I'm talking about. But what, why do our teenagers and 20s gravitate to gangs? I've had the gang members tell me why. That's their family. That's where they find the care and the protection and so on and so on. Oh, it's so twisted. And I, the whole of what I've just said is so twisted. It's so dark. It is so tragic. We were created to the father and his family and to know home and to know family there in that identity with that focus. And we missed it. When did we miss this? in the Garden of Eden. That's the first glimpse you get of what I'm talking about. That the whole of mankind was there, you understand, because the two, the Adam, Adam and uh, Eve, the, the man and the woman, that, that was the whole of mankind. Out of those two we all came. And, and so here's the first glimpse of the human family. And, and they are frolicking in the garden of abundance and delight. And the Lord himself in his glory walks in the midst of the garden. You could say that was the nursery. I say it was just a glimpse. They, they never really got it. But it's a glimpse. It's a glimpse of family. The nursery. And, and, and what was sin? Sin was walking away from the purpose, the purpose that they should be the mature family of the Father in the Son through the Spirit in creation. That was the purpose, and they walked away from it. They left Father's house. They left home, and they went out into the wilderness as orphans, self Chosen, self-described orphans. Jesus talked about it in the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal, whether he ever had it. No, he didn't have it. He, he never understood the father-son relationship. And he leaves home and... and if, if we had time to expand it, but I think you know the story well enough, that he goes into the far country and he tries to buy friends. He tries to purchase a family with, with the money that he leaves home with. It says he's spent it on all this wild living. Yes, but what is wild living? Except trying to buy friends, trying to have enough money to attract people and have them, you know, you buy the next round of drinks and probably the next round. And you've all, you're there, the center, you've got the money, you see, and the people are drawn to you. And he's lost all sense of family. He's lost all sense of home and father and son. And, and, and so when he finally comes home, when the money runs out, the friends disappear. And, and when he comes home, do you remember those words when he says, I am not worthy to be called your son? That is, he is saying, in effect, I don't use the family name. I, 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 don't, I don't tell people that you're my father and I'm your son. That, that's out of my life now. And I'm coming home to be your hired servant. He's coming home to get a temporary job. Well, Jesus used this word. Only in the New Testament, it comes up as the word lost. You see, um, some of our good friends, when they use the word lost, they put a certain tone to their voice. You know, he's a lost sinner. Uh, and we, we've sort of then put into the word the idea of darkness forever and damned and lost and cursed and unwanted and rejected. He's lost. 
Well, that's not the meaning of the word. Jesus used the word to describe something precious, you see. Precious. I've told you this before. I mean, if, if you lose something that's of supreme importance in your life, you say you lost it. If, if you let something go missing that doesn't mean anything to you, you don't bother to use the word lost. It's gone missing. Now, Jesus used the word lost because he was speaking of something precious, precious. But also, this something precious was lost in its secondary meaning that it was solitary. The word we've been looking at, he was alone. He was isolated. He's out there in the wilderness and he's wandering and he's a prey to any predator that will come by and abused by anyone. So Jesus used that same word and that's the fact. Now I, I'm getting the gospel. The gospel is, yes, Jesus did use the same word. Why? Because he is the son coming from the father. Or can I put it this way? The father and the son and the spirit. There's the family, the holy trinity. There is the ultimate, the final definition of home. And the Father wants us in his home, and he sends the Son into the lonely ghetto streets that we call life in order to reveal to us home, to reveal to us the longing heart of the Father, and then to take us to the Father. That's the gospel. So Jesus described himself to Nathaniel. He said he was the ladder by which heaven came to earth and earth was joined to heaven. And then in the upper room, do you remember, he said, I am the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. And in Matthew 11, he said, no one knows the Father except the Son. And then he said, and to whomsoever I reveal him. And so, did you hear me? Jesus came in order to take us, the solitary, the lonely, the abused, and those who had lost all sense of worth and meaning, to embrace us into himself and take us to the Father, to bring us back home, to bring us into the family, home. Do you get it? You see, could I put it like this? Jesus, look at Jesus. He's the taste of home. He's the Father being revealed here to us in and through our humanity. You want to know what home is like? Look at the relationship Jesus had with the Father. And he's sharing that with us. He's saying this is what home is like. It's very difficult for us to understand because we're so used to the ghetto. We're so used to the streets. We're so used to looking over our shoulder. We're so used to being mugged. We're so used to one great big chaotic nightmare but he came into that he became one with us in that and he said i've come to reveal to you i've come to show you i've come to explain to you what home is like and a home is all about the father and i'm the only one that can take you back there because the father sent the son to take us there and it says in Hebrews that he would take us, the many sons and daughters, to glory. Or you could say the one and only Son of the Father came in order to carry back a multitude of sons and daughters. And so he's the taste of home. He's the touch of home. Feel the touch of Jesus and you, you've felt what home is like. You've Look at Jesus as he loves. Look at his compassion. Look at his weeping over sinners. Look at his joy. When we will join his joy, 
okay, then you've touched, you've tasted, you've smelled home. You, you know what I mean by that? Again, if, if you've had no family, then you won't. But just let me tell you, home has a smell to it. Smell. It, it's... Have you, did you have a grandmother, grandfather, and did you go and visit? And would you know what I meant? The smell of grandma's house? It's, it's the smell of cooking. It, it's it's the, the smell of those familiar sofas. It, it's, it's the smell of home. To, to walk into that, you know, no, I, I'm home. I've come to a safe place. To get into that bed and you, you pull those covers around you and you know this is home. Well, you see, Jesus is the smell of home. He's the smell of the Father. I hope you know what I'm talking about here. Uh, he is the sound of the joy of home. You see, he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Go through his parables. How many of the parables of Jesus all talk about sitting down at a party and having a jolly good time together? I know that's not religious. I shouldn't say that. But read, read the Gospels. How many times Jesus describes what he's come to do in terms of a party. And when he's found the son, found the, the sheep, and found the coin... It, it, what is it? Come, rejoice with me, gather the whole city together, bring them all in, rejoice with me, because I have found we've got another person home. And then in Revelation, of course, we always quote that to unbelievers, but Jesus was speaking to believers who had never got it. They'd never seen that the whole thing was about Father and his family. And so Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Incidentally, if you read that carefully, he was standing at the door of the church. Dear Lord, the church who hadn't got a clue why they were a church. They thought it was some sort of supper club. That They came together on a Sunday just to be the church. Jesus said, I'm knocking on the door because I don't belong in there, but I, I'm, I'm knocking on the door. And if any individual, see, he said, as a mass, they've forgotten what it's all about. But if any individual hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. And, and that's a word in the language of the New Testament, which meant I will join in the family meal. It wasn't just any old meal, it wasn't a snack, it wasn't lunch, it wasn't breakfast. No, it was a specific meal that we've translated sup. It, it, actually, we have extended that into English as supper. It, 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 it means the evening meal. And these people, because they didn't have TV, and so what do you do at night? When you sit down at the table, you don't get up from the table until it's time to go to bed. It's there for visiting. It's time for sharing. It's time for the joy of family. And Jesus describes to these people, you've totally missed it. You're doing your religious thing there. Well, if anybody above the hubbub and the din of your religion, if anybody can hear my voice, I want to have supper. I want to come and join in the family meal and we can visit till the cows come home. That's what he was saying. And what I've told you before, the words eternal life don't mean living forever. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, P.S., that's, that's true. But eternal life means, and Jesus said what it means in John 17, 3, to know the Father and to know the Son. And it's that word of intimacy. It's that word of being wide open. And though he knows me through and through, I'm safe in his love and through the blood of Jesus. You see, you get it, I say it again, you get a glimpse of what real home is. How? In, in his teaching, in his teaching, it shocked all religious leaders. He revealed the love of the Father. Home I, I tell you what home looks like. This is what the family of the Father looks like as he lay hands on the sick and he heals them. 
as he takes bread and it multiplies and feeds the multitudes, as he goes to a wedding and he fills 180 gallons of water and makes them wine. He says, this is what Father looks like, you see. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And religion says, no, no. But that's what home smells like. That, that, when, that, that's what home feels like. And the whole focus of home is him. Because Jesus said, you'll never know the Father. You'll never know what's happening except through me. And you'll never come to the Father except through me. And so home, the central figure of home that the Father glorifies and the Spirit glorifies, even as Jesus glorifies the Father and the Spirit, but the center, it says that he might have the preeminence. It's all through Jesus. It's all through him. And, and so... When, when you come to home, that's what it looks like. And we got the first whiff of it in Jesus. And of course, to taste home in Jesus, to meet the Father in the face of Jesus, to meet the Holy Spirit loving you on the inside, is to be spoiled forever. Yes, I mean it. You're spoiled forever. You were such a good religious person. Then you met Jesus and everything went to pot. Because you're spoiled now. You're spoiled for all the sham imitations that mankind has invented. Those twisted distortions of the lie. Trying to have something in the place of the God family. You can never go back to life as it used to be. You remember when Peter and the others were absolutely shocked out of their mind by what Jesus was saying. And everybody was walking away and saying, I can't handle this. And Jesus turned to them, the disciples, and he said, well, are you going to go too? And Peter's response, you, you, know, you know how, he said, Lord, to whom can we go? Which means... <laughs> If there was somewhere else, we'd be gone because we don't know what you're talking about. We're actually embarrassed by you right now. But to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life and we're not going, even though we are embarrassed right now and we don't know what you're talking about, but we're not leaving. See, apart from Jesus risen from the dead in a real, authentic human body, now filled with life that cannot die. Jesus, in the invisible half of the universe, ascended and alive now. Apart from that Jesus, anything else is empty, futile, living death religion. And he's not teasing. He said he would take us to the Father. He said he'd come to start the human race again and go where Adam had never gone. And so in John 14 and from verse 15 on, and you can read it because our time is rapidly going, so I can't read the whole thing. But, but just a bit here and there. He says, y you, you know him, the Holy Spirit. He abides with you. See, abide, same word as abode, meaning dwelling, meaning home, the place you live, same, same idea. He abides with you and will be in you. He's going to take this abiding inside of you. Then he said, I will not leave you as orphans. What our text is talking about. But I will come to you, so the Holy Spirit will come. He will come. And in that day, he says, you shall know that I am in my Father. So he says, in that day, I will have gone to my Father. I came from my Father. And on that day, when I've done what I was sent to do, I'm going to my Father. And you will know that I am in the Father. But in that day, you, you will be in me. And where's he? In the Father. 
You'll be home. He said, in that day, I am in my Father, you in me, I in you. Do you get it? We will be united in the Father, a vast family of sons and daughters, and Jesus, the Son, God the Son, still clothed in our humanity because he said, I'm now one of you as surely as I am in the Father. And when did that happen? On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. That's when it happened. And he goes on to say, and as I'm skipping this through, but he says, My Father will love you. And, listen to this, we, we, that is the Father and the Son and the Spirit. He's been talking of himself and the Father and the Spirit. Then he says, we will come to you and make our abode. And that's the place you live in. Abode with him. He came to set us into families. And to miss that is to miss the gospel. I'm not saying you're not a Christian, but you've missed why Jesus came. And he who is the son of the family, who came in order to multiply the family of the Holy Trinity to multitudes and multitudes, he comes where we are, joined us in our isolation. And in his sufferings, Jesus, do I, I don't need to tell you, but I'll, I'll just quickly underline it to you. What happened in his suffering? He joined us in the ghetto. He became where we are. And he became where we are at our hands. He's alone. Maybe as no human being has ever been alone. He was betrayed. His closest said they never knew him. He was rejected forsaken. He was solitary, isolated. Or well, one of the prophetic Psalms puts it so vividly, he said, like a sparrow on the housetop. You know, just one lonely sparrow on a cold and windy day. There doesn't seem to be another sparrow in existence, and that one has all its feathers ruffled by the wind, and it's just there alone. And the psalmist saw it and said, that, that's, that's alone. He was abandoned. He was abused by human and by demon spirit predators. He was cursed because when they said crucify him to the Jewish people, that phrase meant damn him to hell. And on the cross he entered into so where we are that he felt what we feel and he said why have you forsaken me he who is the glory of the father's family he who was the glory of Eden came where we are in the wasteland of lostness outside of Eden and he comes and he joins us in order to take us home. He says, you don't belong here. You were never created to be here. And he carried us through death. In death, he brought to an end our relationship to Satan and sin and death. And in his resurrection, he carried us. In his humanity, he carried us to the Father. And so he said to Mary, I ascend, or I'm going to my Father. Yes, but now he adds a phrase, and your Father, we're going home. Well, just before that, he had said, in my Father's house are many abodes, dwelling places. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where did he go? The cross and the grave and resurrection. That's where he went. That where I am, the son of the father, there you may be also. And we are given a seat 
Why did it? I said, set among you, set. Well, we're given a seat in the heavenly places. We're given a place in the house. And we are there with honor. Oh, cut that out when you keep saying, I'm guilty, I'm no good, I'm an unworthy sinner. Please, have you heard the gospel? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Have you heard it? Have you heard it? Here, here comes the prodigal. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Basically, if you read that, that, that scripture a few hundred times, you'll hear it. Basically, the Father says, shut up. He says, you are my son. You were lost, you're found. You were dead, you're alive. Oh, yes. <laughs> you sit down with honor. You sit down and rest. You sit down, you're safe. You've come home. You've come home through Jesus, who's the only one who can take you home. And it's the Holy Spirit who is making that, who witnesses with your spirit. And what does he say within you? Abba, Father, yes, inside of you, he inspires you. Even as he witnesses it's true, he inspires you to say, Father, I'm home. I'm home. We've come home, and, and that's why I, I say so often to the kitchen table of the Holy Trinity. I, I say that not to be cute or whatever. I say it because... In a home, I usually find it's the kitchen table that is the magnet. It's not the dining room table. That's for special occasions. It's the kitchen table where the smell of cooking is going on and where people just hang out and visit. Well, we have been taken to the very heart of the Holy Trinity. And we sit there. You see... He sets the solitary in families. And this is where it's going to take next week. But I, I'm going to say a bit anyway. You see, he goes on, that verse says, that the, the prisoner, the, the one who has been shackled, pre imprisoned, it, it says he, he set free to prosperity. Then he goes on and said, he takes the solitary and sets them in families. And, and so often in our modern idea of evangelism, we don't go that far. We, we say to those that are bound that you can be free, and that's where we leave them. Free. To do what? For what? Hang out until you die, brother, because when you die, you go to heaven. Yeah, right. No wonder we have those things. What do they call them? Backsliders. No wonder. Um, and, and then he says he set us in families and that's a parallel line in, in the Hebrew so the prosperity you're taken from bondage from solitariness and, and you are you have the prosperity being placed in families see the, the prodigal didn't come home merely to be forgiven in fact that that story Jesus does not in any way emphasize forgiveness. It's sort of assumed it's there in the background, but the word is never used. The whole thing was the son came home to get a job, to get some food in his stomach. Instead, he is met with the embrace of the father who did not say, you are forgiven and I'll give you a job and you can get your act together. No, he, he's going to bear hug a crushing rib crushing hug and he says you are my son you're my son and i'm gonna put clothes on you to make you look like my son because you are my son and i'm gonna put the family ring on your finger and i'm gonna put shoes on your feet and you're gonna walk into my house and when you get there the party will be in full sway and there'll be dancing and there'll be music and we've killed the calf that we've been fattening up for years do you understand this is the gospel you're not just forgiven you are hurried to the family feast 
And the awful end of that parable is the elder brother who refused to be part of the family if his brother is included in that family. The father had dismissed the past and said, This day I declare you are my son, and well you may have been dead, but you're alive now. Well you may have been lost, but you're found now, and that's all that counts. And my son, you shall be parted, you shall be celebrated. Honor, worth, sit. But the authority of a son, suddenly. But the elder brother, he lived in the past. He put his brother in a box labeled sinner. And therefore, when he came home in the eyes of that poor, warped, twisted elder brother, he was still in the box. And he said, how can you celebrate this scumbag? And he walked away. He chose not to be in the family if his brother was in the family. But this is what I want to leave you with, which I'm going to take up next week. It's in the plural. He said, I set you in families. So we're in the family of the father. But in the family of the father, we have a multitude of brothers and sisters, you see. And, and so the family that we are part of in the Holy Trinity through Jesus, that is on earth in many families because we're limited by time and space. It is very true to say that you and I are family. You often use the term when, when you're chatting there. And it is. It's very real. But... What this is talking about is someone that you can touch, someone who can speak to you and you speak to them. Other brothers and sisters who have been brought into this incredible relationship with the Father through the Son and by the Spirit. And that love that is in the Holy Trinity that you have come to know through Jesus, through the Spirit, is now shared and you become a little family on earth that is a reflection of the family that is our family of the Holy Trinity. You see, many people say, I love Jesus. Well, hold it. This is next week, but you, you can't just love Jesus. He said, if you love me, keep my commandment. What's his commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you. So, do you get that? His love is showered upon us. But that love is not just sent back to him to make it a two-way sort of vertical relationship. No, that's in other religions where you have a private relationship to whatever you think is God. No, this, the way, this gospel is that he loved us. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandment to love your brothers and sisters as I have loved you. So you bring the love of the Trinity and you share it with other human beings and become a community like unto the Holy Trinity from whence it all flows. Do you get that? John went all the way, and it will take us a time to get through John. But in his first epistle, he says, I, I mean, if, if, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar, the truth is not in you. And he also said, by this we know we have passed from life, from death to life, because we love the brethren. So we're not, we're not saved into now a sort of holy isolation. We're saved to family. Not to a vertical love, but to a horizontal love. Family love, reaching out to other believers. 
never exclusive, ready to include all the new brothers and sisters. And you say, oh, that's nice. How warm and fuzzy. No, it takes the full energy and power of the Holy Spirit to bring that to pass. Because I'm not talking about human love, which is warm and fuzzy and nice and passes away. This says Colossians 1, that you, you might know, that you might be strengthened with all the strength of God. The Greek word is in strength and in dunamis. And that strength is according to the pure power of God himself. In order that you might. And then he goes on to describe loving one another. You can't do that apart from the Holy Spirit. And Philippians 2 says that you believers in your relationship to each other should have the mind of Christ. And he says the only way you can have that is work it out with fear and trembling. This is the most solemn, most important thing that you will ever do on this planet. So do so with, with due respect, which is the meaning fear and trembling. But he says, don't forget, for it is God, the Holy Spirit, who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That is, love one another. Well, I could, well, I will next week. But what I'm saying is we were born again to sit at the table of fellowship, not only with the Holy Trinity, but with the Holy Trinity in our brothers and sisters, to sit around the table of the Holy Communion and to commune with Father, Son, Holy Spirit and the whole family who dwell in the Son. To be in a safe place where we are loved with a love that originates in Jesus and the Father, that is actualized by the Holy Spirit coming from other believers and to give that as well as to receive it. You say, where on earth can I find that? I told you when I began that I, I speak these words out of longing uh, because, yeah, we, we are in a valley of dry bones. We, we, we are almost in the valley of the shadow of death when it comes to what I'm talking about. But this is his promise. He promised he would set us in families. And so the cry of my heart is, O oh Lord, fulfill your promise and set us in families. And you might say, well, that's easy for you. No, it isn't. It isn't. Because, you see, I can visit with many believers, but family is when I can be known and know and when I can support and be supported. This is what's happening in your neighborhood, in your town. Other believers coming together in this love. So lay hold upon this promise. Seize this promise that you shall find those in your neighborhood who shall be the family that shall be the love of God in that place. Declare this promise before the Lord. I believe there's never been a time like this when we need to enter into this. And that's why I'm going to take a, an hour next week to delve into this and how does he do it and how does it work. And so may the Lord bless us all. Amen. And I'm now going to open for your sharing, your questions. Um, and could I say again, let's keep more or less in, in, in this subject that we're talking about. And let me tell you, because there's been chat, thank you for your gifts. Um, we had that emergency uh, with the trees. We had to go ahead just believing that the Lord would supply. And I thank you for those that have given and you have been, you have been family. And um, that indeed is something that is so real, though it's not quite what we're talking about. But it is real. 
We're, we are a virtual family and we experience through the internet the, the love of God flowing between us. And so I thank you for your gifts. We still have not fully met the need, but um, I thank you for everything that you have given. And also thank you for those that have given to this um, broadcast that we make. Well, I, I assure you this goes, I mean there's only by comparison a few of us here tonight, uh, but by the end of this week thousands upon thousands around the world throughout the US and Canada, throughout Europe and the Africas, down Pacific Rim all the way to Australia and New Zealand will be watching this and um, it's because of your giving, those of you that donated we can do this because we have to pay for this and every minute that we take and, and so thank you everyone and as I've said to many you are, you do not you do not you do not give to a ministry you are that ministry in your giving so thank you okay let's open this up <laughs> 